In this video, I'm going to go over the 2017 uh, Grade 9 Science VAT. With this one, I am specifically going over electrical principles and technologies. Okay, number 31. So we've got something interesting here. So if you don't remember this, this is basically a battery. Um, well, almost, our picture is a little bit different here. But essentially we've got our electrodes, which are the metals that are going to help generate a current. So um, there's a lot more chemistry involved in this. I'm just gonna give, it, give you the simple one. Basically, we are creating a battery really similar to the battery you might've had when you were kids. Um, with those batteries, you have a positive and a negative end, and that's gonna allow the electrons to flow through, generating a current that can power the toy. In this example, same idea, we're just not powering a toy, we're a toy, we're measuring the voltage. So what's interesting about this is they've chosen electrodes, two electrodes, but they've chosen two electrodes that are the exact same. So because they're the exact same, that's not gonna induce a current. There's no way for the electrons to move from positive to negative. So for this one to work, we're actually gonna need to swap it with another electrode, which will help generate the current. So therefore, if we look at our options here, there's really only one that's gonna work. So I'm gonna go through all of them. Reversing the, um, the leads on the voltmeter, that's not gonna make a difference because there's no current being generated. B and C are quite similar in the sense that they're saying it's the acid um, and increasing the amount of acid is going to increase the current. That's not the case, again, if you don't have electrons moving from one sign to the other. So our only option for this one is going to be option D, where we change one of the electrodes. In this case, we're gonna change it to zinc and that's gonna generate our current. Number 32. So with this one, we wanna make sure we are clear of our terms that are very specific to um, energy. So again, I'm gonna kind of avoid looking at the options and just look and see what's happening here. So they've given us a legend with our battery, our light bulb, and our switch. So if we're thinking about converting energy, we are converting from one form of energy to another in order to get this um, light bulb to, to work. So our battery, that's really gonna be our chemical energy, kind of like the question we just did, right? We're converting some chemical energy or we're use, utilizing chemical, we are utilizing chemical energy and we're converting it to something that can power something. So um, our battery is definitely gonna be chemical energy. Now we need to think about our light bulb. Well, our light bulb is going to be powered by something and it's gonna be powered by electricity, right? The first thing is in order for the light bulb to actually do its thing, it needs electricity or it needs a current to run through it. So that's gonna be electricity or electrical energy. Okay, then we kind of have the byproduct of a light bulb. Now, uh, when I was a kid, um, I often played with an easy bake oven and for that easy bake oven to work, you need a light bulb to go inside and the light bulb is actually gonna bake the food, which is interesting because what that means is the light bulb is actually really inefficient. It's producing so much extra heat um, or thermal energy. So in the case of this example here, as the light bulb gets powered and is working, it's producing thermal energy. So we need to find an option that will look at chemical energy, converting to electrical energy, converting that to thermal energy. So the only option that's gonna fit this one is going to be option A. Number 33. So with this question, they're asking you two different things. A, do you know your terminology? And B, do you know where to place those things in a circuit that it's going to be able to, to function? So um, with this uh, question, there's two things to consider. The switch will control both the motor and the light bulb, and the user will be able to control the brightness of the light bulb. Okay, so for controlling the brightness of the light bulb, that means we're going to be looking at a variable resistor. So a variable resistor is something that slows down the current enough that it changes the speed or brightness of the product. So in this case, if we're applying a variable resistor to a light bulb, it's gonna slow down the brightness of the light bulb. So that means, um, as I'm placing everything here, so based on the options, we need to decide where these four items are going to be located on this circuit. So our series, our circuit is set up in a series. Our circuit is set up in a series, which means um, we're going to need to place the we're going to need to we're going to need the switch to control both the motor and the light bulb. So 
For this to work, the only option that can work um, well is going to be placing the switch at item W. And that's because the switch has to turn on and allow the current to flow through the battery, which will then allow the flow of the current to go to um, X and the last two here. So this would have to be our switch. And then we're gonna have our flow of current through the battery. And then it says here our variable resistor, we know is going to be used to control the brightness of the light bulb. That means our variable resistor has to come before the light bulb. So it should be this one here because uh, as that is controlling the brightness of the light bulb, you would want it to be to go, you'd want it to work before the bulb. So that means this one is going to be our variable resistor and this one here is our bulb, right? So the variable res resistor is going to control the brightness of the bulb. And then with X, well, X is the only thing that's left over, which is our motor. And if we also think about this, as our switch is turned on, that's gonna allow the electrons to flow to turn the motor on, as well as the bulb. So both switch, both, the switch is able to control both the motor and the bulb. So uh, if you look at our options to fit this, the only one that's going to fit will be option D, where we've got our switch, motor, variable resistor, and light bulb, all in the order that I just mentioned. Number 34. So let me read the question out loud and then we'll talk about it. So Jake needs to repair a car stereo system. The system contains a, st a stereo and a fuse that are connected in a series and two speakers that are connected in parallel. So the first thing we need to do is remember the difference between a series and a parallel system. So with a series, if one of the items goes out, the other items don't work. In a parallel, because you've got different ways the current can flow, if one of those items doesn't work anymore, the circuit will still continue to work. So if we're looking at this, we need um, a diagram that has both parallel and series circuit. So option D automatically isn't gonna work because it's just a series. Now, if we're looking at the fact that the stereo system has a fuse and, or sorry, that the system has a stereo and a fuse that are connected in series, we need an option where we have one loop that just contains the stereo and the stereo and the fuse. So the only one that I'm looking at that that actually fits that is option B. If I'm if as I trace that out, that is one loop in a series circuit where the fuse and the stereo are connected together. If I look at option A and C, this one just has the fuse. It's not talking about the stereo, so that wouldn't work to fit the definition at the top there. And if I'm looking at option C, that is a series circuit, but it's only looking at the stereo. So A and C are also gonna be eliminated, leaving us with option B. The other reason I know it's option B is if we look at both speakers, those are contained in a parallel circuit. So our answer for this question is option B. Number 35. A grade nine student used an amp meter to measure the current of a circuit consisting of a bulb. An amp meter and a 1.5, oh, and a, sorry, and an amp meter and a 1.5 volt, volt battery. She then changed the, vo the voltage of various batteries and measured the resulting currents using the same bulb, bulb and amp meter. So here's her, here is her circuit set up. And our question is based on the information in the graph. So we just need to look at the graph. If a 10.5 volt battery were used, then the expected amp meter reading would be. So what I'm gonna do is focus in on just that graph. So this question is really assessing your knowledge, again, of looking at scientific graphs. So one thing I noticed with the graph right away is if I were to continue this graph, it would go on. And that's perfect because the question's asking me what would happen if I used a 10.5 volt meter, 10.5 voltage battery. So 10.5, we know it's gonna fall somewhere here. Right in the middle would be 11, okay? That wouldn't be 10.5. They've purposely done a scale of two at the bottom, okay? So that would be 11.5, which means 10.5 has to be in between there. So I'm gonna pop 10.5 at about here, right? Because about there would be 11 and then 11.5 and you get the idea. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna do is extend my graph as best as I can. 
And now I'm going to use that graph to help me answer what the amp meter, would, amp meter reading would be at a temp, using a 10.5 voltage battery. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me. Apparently I can't speak this evening. So um, here's our 10.5. We're going to go ahead and extend it all the way up. And we're getting a reading a little past five, um, five amp meters. So I'm going to just put a little note there, a little past five. So maybe five point... I want to say like, it's not quite five and a half. I want to say about 5.3 or 5.2. So now if we look at our options, once we've extended that graph, there's only really one option that's going to fit there. So like I said, it's not really half. So it's not going to be C, it's not A, not D. Our answer is going to be B here. Number 36. So this question um, at first glance kind of looks like you have to do some math here because you've got some numbers here, but for this question, you actually don't. So let me go ahead and read it and then let's chat about it. So a student is testing the conductivity of four different substances. He uses a 2.5 volt battery and rec records the current in the circuit in each of the four substances. So there's our four substances. The chart below indicates the current measure. Which, uh, which substance is most likely an insulator? So we need to first think about what an insulator is. So an insulator is something that's not gonna be able to conduct electricity really well. We use it on the outside of wires, so your charger for your phone will have an insulator on it. Um, they use it for uh, certain types of gloves for anyone that's handling um, specific types of current. So we need an insulator. We need something that's not gonna be able to conduct electricity or at least conduct electricity really well. So that means we can't think of Q as an option because that conducts electricity really well. Same thing with substance uh, S and T. Even though they're measured in different units, they're still conducting quite a bit of electricity. The best one that is going to be used as an insulator is one that's conducting the least amount of energy, which in this case is going to be substance R, making our answer, making our answer to this question be number 37. So this one is actually a math question. So what we need to do is we need to calculate power for the given information above. So um, the tricky part with this one is we need to recognize that we have to use a formula here. So the formula we are gonna use is this one here. So power is equal to current times voltage. So our current is gonna be measured in amps. And our voltage, of course, is going to be measured in volts. So now we just have to see from that information above which numbers we have to use, because they might have given us some extra information in this question. So I'm looking at it. We have our amps as four. We have our voltage, which is 100. So that, now all we have to do is multiply those two numbers together. Four times 100. Well, that's going to give us a, um, a reading of 400. So the, question, the answer for this one is D. Numerical response number four, so we're on this one here. Um, what you need to recognize is there is a formula we have to know, and that's efficiency. So let me back up. In this question, we need to figure out which one has the most efficient system. And a key thing we need to remember here is we are going to need to express that number as a percentage. Okay, so that means whatever answer we get, we're going to need to multiply by 100. So efficiency is um, measured as output over input or it's basically using the least amount of inputs to achieve the highest amount of output, right? So that means the system would be efficient. It's gonna take the energy that it's, the energy that it's receiving, it's gonna roughly as close, to po as, close as possible produce that same amount of energy out. That way nothing is um, being released as waste, uh, like thermal energy or whatever it is the waste is going to be. So with this um, question, I, there is a little bit of a shortcut. So what you can do is you can look at the differences between these numbers and see which one actually has the smallest difference because that one would be the most efficient. So right now I can notice that uh, this one here is about, what, like almost 200 off. Uh, 36 and 90, that's a little less than half. So those two aren't gonna work. Now, if you need to, if that doesn't work for you, you can also calculate it by going output over input. When you calculate it, the um, efficiency for P is about zero, is 0 0.5, and the efficiency for Q is 0 0.4. And just remember to multiply those numbers by 100 to get the percentage. Now, our last one, the difference between the input and the output is quite small. So 15 over 12, I'm gonna get 0 0.8 
When I multiply that by 100, that will give me 80%, meaning that um, system R is very efficient. 80% of the energy it uses, it's converting that into doing its job, whatever that job is. So the answer for number four is going to be 80. Okay, number 38. So we wanna know which of the following actions will not reduce energy in a home. So um, basically we need to think about the different options and whether or not that's either gonna keep your heat in, uh, especially in the winter time, right? If your heat's not contained in your home, then it's escaping outdoors, then you then have to run the heat more, which isn't efficient for your home or your bill as well. So um, which ones will not reduce energy, will not uh, reduce the waste energy in the home? Replacing a single pane window with a double pane window. So with a single pane window, what that means is you are not able to isolate the energy inside the home as well as a double pane window, right? So you've got basically like an extra blocker that's gonna keep that energy inside. So that one's gonna be pretty efficient. Um, installing a programmable thermostat to control a furnace. Of course, if it's programmable, that means when everyone is off to work in school in the home, the furnace isn't gonna be running as high and that is gonna save um, some energy. Option C, wrapping an insulated blanket around a hot water tank, that is going to be helpful, right? It's going to make sure um, all the energy is contained in the water tank, so that one's going to work. The last option is installing an air conditioner to reduce temperatures. While uh, that is very nice in our summers when it gets really, really hot, um, it is going to uh, not reduce the amount of energy. You're going to be consuming more energy. Anyone who has an air conditioner at, um, at home knows that when that's running, the bill is going to be a little bit higher, so that's going to be our correct answer. Number 39. So with this one, we need to decide which one is actually going to be the least uh, consistent. So that means in terms of the energy that they give us and our options, it's the one that we can't always 100% rely on. Um, I'm also going to make an assumption here that they are talking about it with specific to Alberta uh, weather conditions, because in other places of the world, it might be a little bit more reliable, but that's my assumption. So anyway, let's keep going. So um, hydro and nuclear, those are pretty efficient. And, right, as long as the water is running and the nuclear power is going, we're good. Nuclear, like I said, is gonna be good. Hydro, like I said, is gonna be good. That leaves us with only option A. And the reason for that is if it's not windy, you're not going to have um, the consistent amount of energy being put through. And then of course with Alberta in our winters, it's not gonna be consistent to use solar power. So that is going to be the answer there. Number 40 here. So um, with this, we are looking at the positives and negatives of a particular energy source, and we have to decide what that energy source is most likely gonna be here. So um, one of the things that I kind of noticed right away is when I look at the disadvantages, we've got a couple of things here that aren't good for our environment. It is a non-renewable resource. That one's actually really important. It contributes to, uh, to global warming climate change, and it disrupts natural habitats. So in this list, as I'm going through it, well, this one is a renewable energy source. So is this one, and so is this one. So if all of those are renewable, that's not what the table is talking about. That means our answer for question 40 is going to be D. Okay, that is it for me with regards to this unit. Make sure you keep an eye for our last unit that I'm gonna go through, which is space. In the meantime, everybody, good luck studying. If you all need any help or you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, whether it's this video or some of the other ones, and I'll do my best to get back to you before your exam. Good luck studying everyone, and I will see you all in our last video.